so hopefully everybody can see um, the screens all right. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Um, next month is uh, is um, uh, going to be the um, uh, one of the people from the Emily Dickinson Museum is going to be our speaker, and a little bit of poetry and um, old time bird watching here in Massachusetts. So that'll be interesting, a little different different take. March we're going to be doing a geology talk with Harry Shabaugh, and um, again, uh, you know, things are percolating along. I just want to take a moment and thank everybody that uh, donated to our uh, audiovisual upgrade uh, event. Um, as of today, you know, I'd asked originally for 5,000 bucks and I tend to go low. Um, <laughs> we've actually, we've actually raised over $10,200. And um, so we're able to, to uh, purchase a laptop to go with us, a dedicated laptop a couple upgrades to the equipment. So um, even after we get back to the post pandemic life, um, we'll be able to do um, in person and, and hybrid uh, events so that uh, so many of our friends that live farther away will still be able to watch our, our um, programs. And even speakers from far away will be able to come in and talk to a live audience in, in the environmental center. So it's pretty exciting to have all that done. Um, while we've been closed, there's been a lot of work going on. And um, I really, uh, uh, you know, take my hat off to the, to the volunteers and there's about a dozen of them. And, you know, we've built new stairs to the cellar. We've got um, all the floors have been cleaned and, and refinished and the walls have all been painted. Um, it looks a little upside down right now because all the exhibit cases are all in one room and most of the animals are, are upstairs. So we have to rebuild all the exhibits and, and bring new exhibits into play. So um, it's really going to be uh, fun to, to get through this as we get through this whole period. Um, you know, we're probably looking at probably summertime before things are somewhat back to normal. So we'll just have to wait and see. But um, I'm hoping uh, Jeff Johnstone will be running his spring field trips starting in uh, in April, um, and we'll see how the uh, how our rules of the COVID rules apply. But right now we're limited to eight people in a group, and uh, no carpooling and no sharing of optical equipment and stuff. So that's that's happening. Um, we have several other programs, you know, out field trip type stuff that's going to happen. And, um, and again, a lot of it's going to depend on what we're able to do with uh, the rules and regs of the day. So if, uh, if the new administration winds up getting us all vaccinated, we'll have a little more freedom. And uh, so anyway, so um, I want to thank uh, Sarah Mildred, who's with me tonight here as, as my uh, technical back person. Um, and uh, with that, I just want to introduce Jeff. And uh, Jeff's an old friend and uh, um, been birding for many years now. And uh, it's funny, I was just looking at some slides that Chris Coyle was, was uh, putting together. And boy, that's, I don't even recognize all those people. I saw a picture of myself the other day from 1964. And I was going, wow, that kid was skinny with blonde hair and all that. But uh, well, the, the club has a very rich history, and it and it's great that we're able to, uh, to 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 keep it alive. And one of the new exhibits in the building is going to be uh, uh, we fixed up a particular hallway in the first floor, and it's going to be kind of an historical look back at what uh, what the club's done in over almost fifty five years. So um, that's uh, going to be pretty good. So with that said, um, I'm going to introduce Jeff. Uh, who's been one of, you know, I followed Jeff on Facebook and I, I kind of, that was kind of the reason I asked him to come and, and talk to us. He's really been scoring all these wonderful birds all year, uh, you know, getting great images of them too. So um, I'm lucky if I can find them and see them. And uh, Jeff's wound up actually having uh, some great success with, um, with actually uh, 
photographing them and, and, and sharing them with us. So um, without hesitation, uh, I guess I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. And uh, when you're ready, Jeff, you can start up and share your screen and we'll, uh, we'll begin. Okay, thanks, Dave. Yeah, uh, especially has been quite a year and uh, there have been a few that, that, have, got, that have got away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if, uh, let me start sharing the stuff here. Uh, let's say share screen. All right. Do this. This is the hardest part of any program where you, where we get just like getting in and out of a kayak. It's that landing and taking off that really is the trigger here. Yep, it is. There we go. All right. So I hope you can see that. All right. Well, first of all, let me say um, Happy New Year to everybody. I do hope that you and your families are safe and healthy. And to those who are dealing with difficulties brought, up, brought about by this pandemic, I wish for you a speedy recovery. Um, it's my intention that this presentation might bring some small amount of joy to your lives tonight, uh, as I have had the joy of experiences of being out in nature and observing all this beauty, including the birds and landscape and uh, things of that nature. Uh, so to uh, get right into it, uh, many times uh, people ask me during or after the presentation, what am I using for equipment? So I figured I'd get this all out of the way now. Um, I have been a Canon person for many years and continue to be. Uh, I do use a Canon uh, EOS RP, a full frame mirrorless uh, 26 megapixel camera, which does give me a lot of power and I'm able to get some decent photos and I'm able to crop in and zoom in on these um, and not lose too much quality, which is why I have some success with these photos. I also have a big lens, a uh, 500 millimeter lens. And when I add some converters on there, I can uh, in effect uh, double my, my uh, focal range with a 2X converter. Uh, and for those who know cameras, there's a small price to pay for that as far as the aperture value goes, but in, uh, in good lighting, um, uh, it doesn't matter too much. Um, I'll, I've also added here, um, for those interested, if you uh, want to pull up Flickr um, from your browser, um, uh, I do also post my photos up there. And you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, that's, my, uh, that's the address uh, on Facebook. And um, I do post all my bird photos publicly. So you don't have to worry about um, uh, being a friend per se, although I will take you as a friend. <laughs> uh, but if you just follow me, uh, that procedure, you can see all my public content uh, quite easily. So just to, before I dive into what I was able to see this past year, uh, talking about the pandemic in general and have there been benefits for birds and wildlife in general? We know that there have been fewer cars on the road and that certainly has led to less pollutants in the environment. When the air quality improves, the plants thrive, the insects thrive, and the birds thrive off those insects. So certainly that um, has been a benefit. Uh, there's been less noise if people are staying home and driving to work, uh, that's which equals more bird song that's being heard, which uh, helps the birds uh, spread out more possibly. Uh, buildings are not being lit up at night because they're empty. Uh, that leads to fewer nighttime collisions of migrating birds. So that certainly is a benefit. And when we stay at home, uh, we, you know, the people are subtracted from the ecosystem. And during the springtime, did that mean less stress for the birds rearing their young? Uh, that's a possible benefit for the birds. And of course, a lot of people did a lot of backyard birding uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and that meant more people feeding their birds in their own backyard. So that certainly is a benefit for the birds. 
Now, after the initial lockdowns, this might be a negative, but more people have rediscovered the outdoors. Uh, so, you know, not sure how that, you know, how that how that uh, lays out for birds and wildlife. I I have seen <laughs> more than any year in my history, my recent history, um, of the wildlife refugee uh, refuges and uh, our state parks. Uh, overflowing with people getting out and enjoying uh, nature. Um, I mean, I, I personally think it's wonderful. Um, it does make it a little bit more challenging because uh, keeping in mind social distancing and wearing masks, uh, you don't necessarily want to be in a big crowd, uh, but you want to get out there and still enjoy that, get some fresh air when you can. Um, and the other thing uh, that's not really a benefit for the birds is that a lot of people's livelihoods have been affected. Um, and that may not be much of an issue right here in our area, or maybe even in the US in general, but around the world, because the livelihoods have been affected, um, the destitute people will begin to exploit the natural resources um, to try and make up uh, for their loss of their, of their livelihoods. And that's unfortunately uh, going to affect us negatively. So it's, uh, it's as usual, it's a uh, pros and cons of what's happened in here. Um, of course, it's, it, it's only a short term effect in either direction for all of us because um, this will level off and hopefully we will get back to some level of normalcy and uh, maybe we'll take the positives forward and uh, keep, uh, keep things in a better place in a better state for our wildlife. So um, I'll jump right into what, uh, these are the photos um, of the birds that I have uh, seen this past year, despite the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, started off great. Uh, this is New Year's day last year, I was at uh, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, what some of you also known as, know as Plum Island. And uh, there are snowy owls there pretty much regularly now every winter. And I uh, was able to get this one right away on New Year's Day in 2020. And I thought, well, this is off to a, off to a great start. And um, <clears throat> my owl uh, trek continued as I was visiting uh, some friends in Toronto um, in uh, late February. Um, I was actually able to travel about a half hour north of where they were into a town called Schaumburg. I was able to see a very popular northern hawk owl. Um, this happened to be on February 29th, um, our leap year. Uh, so it's kind of unique that, that this kind of happened for me uh, I just, certainly won't forget um, a February 29th like this one. Uh, so the hawk owl is a, is a bird of the boreal forest and they do turn up from time to time in Southern Canada as seen here and the Northern United States. Uh, we had a sighting uh, in Vermont in 2014 uh, up, up in Northern Vermont. That's the, um, as far as I know, that's the uh, southernmost location of this owl, at least in my lifetime. Uh, th there may be others out there that, that I'm not aware of. Uh, but this bird was, is, is uh, this owl was active during the day and uh, he was uh, hunting in the swampy bog area in Schaumburg. Uh, that day there were about, I'd say a dozen other photographers, birders there. And this guy went about his business hunting uh, uh, he picked off a couple of, uh, of voles or shrews up there um, and posed for pictures the entire day. I pretty much spent all day observing, um, getting uh, different uh, photographs in different areas. I love this one in the, uh, in the uh, uh, spruce tree here, uh, really kind of giving me the feel um, of being somewhere deep in the forest, even though I was just in a, outside of a small town. And uh, this owl would uh, fly around the bog uh, and fly across the street, uh, 
almost over a strip mall. Um, and uh, this is a lamp post that he plopped on. And uh, shortly after he was up here, he swooped down, dove right into the snow and pulled up a, a mouse or a vole and flew off to a tree and had his lunch. This owl was, was on my bucket list as far as species that I really wanted to see. Uh, the gaze of this owl, like most owls, I'm definitely, as you can see from my shirt, uh, I, I definitely uh, uh, love the owls and uh, love how they draw you in um, uh, with their eyes. And uh, now as the, I know as the, the lockdown started happening, um, I was still able to get out uh, to see this red-headed woodpecker. And this guy hung around uh, in air. Uh, this photo was taken on April 12th. And uh, he was there for several weeks uh, and then did disappear. Uh, I found him at this nesting cavity. Uh, he was not being very vocal, but going through the motions, I would think of preparing uh, a nest uh, for a possible mate. But I don't believe, any, any, uh, as far as I know, um, it, a mate did not show up. And I would only imagine that this woodpecker flew off, um, possibly to another area to hopefully mate. Uh, the red-headed woodpecker is a near-threatened species in Massachusetts. It remains the rarest of Massachusetts breeding woodpeckers. Uh, and although that's true, I do know that the cases of this woodpecker uh, being seen have increased. Um, we, I had one a couple years ago in Belchertown. Uh, I saw one uh, at Montague Plains last year. And uh, this, that, and also um, here at Ayer, and there is a couple in Princeton. So I'm hoping that they are making a comeback and that they are on their way to becoming more popular. Uh, certainly a beautiful striking bird, um, this red-headed woodpecker. Uh, often gets confused with the red-bellied woodpecker uh, because he, the red bellied has a red stripe on his head. But as you can see, this guy is so unique with his bright red head and his uh, black and white uh, feathers on his back. Now, this guy is a purple gallinule and it is a Gulf Coast bird. And he showed up, he or she showed up um, uh, on May 10th uh, this past year in Dennis, Massachusetts on the Cape. Uh, he was very difficult to photograph because he was in a low swamp area, swampy area uh, next to um, one of the lakes out there. Uh, but he was certainly uh, not afraid of uh, coming up to me. <laughs> At one point it simply, I, I was in my camouflage uh, crouched down taking photos and he walked up to like within four feet of me and before just turning around and going back and uh, checking out uh, some more uh, areas to get food. Uh, one of the most colorful birds that I've ever seen. Uh, love the color differences from the purples to the indigo blues to the greens. And of course you can't miss that red and yellow beak. And the red eye certainly will draw your attention to this bird as well. Um, you can see from the photographs, um, I never got him in a very clear position as he was always walking through the swamps, uh, just doing his thing, uh, digging the ground, scratching the ground, and uh, looking for uh, insects to eat. And of course, what's really crazy about this bird is those huge feet. Um, as with a lot of waders, uh, wading type birds, uh, man, those are some big toenails. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, fascinating to watch him just 
walked around the swampy area. I think I observed him for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, and uh, then he just kind of ended up walking deeper in the swamp and disappeared out of sight. He was there for, he was probably only there for a couple of weeks as far as I know. Um, the, the reports um, stopped um, a few weeks after I took this photo. Hopefully he went down, hopefully he just migrated back down south. Uh, this little guy here is a grasshopper sparrow. And uh, this picture was taken in Lancaster, Massachusetts on May 30th. Uh, very unique looking uh, and sounding sparrow. Uh, it is a threatened species in Massachusetts. And that's be simply because of the of all of our open grasslands declining, uh, which is affecting their nesting ability. Same thing uh, would be for um, our Eastern meadowlarks and other sparrows, uh, Vesper sparrows and things like that that actually utilize and nest in the open grasslands. I know there's a lot of effort being made to uh, create safe open grassland spaces uh, and this guy is very skulky. He's very difficult to get uh, <laughs> uh, close enough to get a photograph, um, but uh, he certainly has a very uh, unique sound. You hear him all over the place, but even in the open grasslands, you don't always see them unless they decide to pop up. I definitely want to go back uh, this uh, spring and uh, Maybe do a better job of camping out in my uh, in a in a in a blind, with the hopes of uh, getting one to come a little bit closer, for um, for more photographs. Another uh, unusual sighting we had uh, this past year was of this horned grebe in breeding plumage, and this uh, bird was in. Marblehead uh, on the North Shore. And in, at this time of the year, he should be in Northwest Canada or up in Alaska. Uh, but for some reason, he was here. And I think he spent almost the entire summer uh, around. And here we have, I was able to sit down on the beach. He was, wasn't afraid uh, of the people on the beach and I uh, was able to watch him diving for food. And here he came up with a, a crayfish, I believe, and uh, proceeded to devour that and go back to his fishing, just wandering along. Again, one of the beautiful red eyes striking about this bird. Um, it was amazing, uh, amazing to see a thing, especially to see this bird in breeding plumage. Uh, I wouldn't have expected to see that. Usually when we see them now at, uh, during this time of the year, uh, they are usually in their non-breeding plumage. Now uh, this uh, is a long tailed duck, uh, not unusual to see them this time of year but there was a few of them who were in the middle of July, this was July 8th, uh, just lounging around uh, the beach in Gloucester. Uh, again, they usually breed in the high Arctic uh, and then they spend their winters along our coast. But uh, for some reason, this group of five, a couple of males, couple of females, uh, were just having a summer vacation in Gloucester. For me, uh, one of the more uh, beautiful ducks uh, with their uh, differences in plumage, um, along with harlequin ducks, uh, I find are my favorite winter ducks. Uh, of course, I also love the wood duck in the summertime. At the same time, the long-tailed ducks were in Gloucester uh, was also this uh, red-necked grebe. Uh, and again, in beautiful breeding plumage, uh, this bird was also uh, around the same Gloucester Beach 
for most of the summer. Uh, and again, this, like the horned grebe, they normally breed in Northwest Canada and Alaska. So uh, very odd to have them uh, around our area uh, during the summertime. Now, well, if uh, people remember, we did have a tropical storm that came through our area, a pretty strong one, um, August uh, 3rd, 4th, and 5th in that area. Um, here is a photo from uh, Wachusett Reservoir of a couple of species that were blown in. And what you see here, uh, the two larger gulls um, are our typical ring-billed gull. And then the two in the middle with the black heads are Bonaparte skulls. And then uh, on the, to the left uh, are two other Bonaparte skulls uh, in, in non-breeding plumage. So with, with the black heads, those, those are the Bonapartes in breeding plumage. And the two of them on the left is non-breeding plumage. And then just for another uh, uh, group photo opportunity, the gull on the right is a laughing gull. So uh, we had a couple of unusual gulls show up. Uh, this was the same storm that brought in the sooty tern uh, that was seen there for a couple weeks, even after the storm. Um, I did see the sooty tern uh, far, far away in my binoculars um, <clears throat> never close enough to get um, a decent photo, uh, but uh, that's what drew me there to the reservoir to see that sooty turn. Um, and uh, these gulls were a bonus. This is a least bittern photographed at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge on August 9th. Uh, the least bittern is an endangered species in our state, uh, but they do breed at Plum Island. And also there's a known breeding along the Sudbury River. Uh, but they are a very skulky and secretive bird. Uh, uh, this morning, I was able to see uh, two of them. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I believe uh, we're talking with other birders that um, at one point in time, they saw three, a uh, couple of immatures along with the adult. So it sounds like they are successfully continuing to breed, which is always nice. Um, and this is also the same area um, at the uh, Bill Forward Pool and the North Pool Overlook uh, where we will sometimes see American bitterns. But this was um, a first for me. Um, very excited to see this bird, a life bird for me. Uh, I usually hear them a lot, but uh, to get a chance to see them um, is very special. <clears throat> this uh, beautiful black and white bird is a swallow-tailed kite. And it was found in Webster, New Hampshire. Um, a little bit uh, west of, north of Manchester, west of uh, Concord, New Hampshire. And uh, this species is typically found in the southeastern US, particularly Florida. Uh, and this bird winters in South America. So he probably got brought up with one of the storms I would imagine uh, that were coming through uh, in the early summer. I was able to, uh, see this bird and he was there for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's amazing to watch this bird. You can see why it's called a swallowtail kite from this picture. Uh, and uh, most of the time, get, get, getting that photograph in the tree was the hard part because he was only, only there very briefly. Uh, he spends most, he spent most of his time uh, flying around the open fields up there and hawking dragonflies. Uh, it's amazing to watch them just uh, soaring up in the thermals 
diving quickly, snatch a dragonfly out of the air. Then you can see him, he will eat it on the wing. So as he's flying, you see his head go down and he'll uh, pull, the, pull the wings off the dragonfly and uh, eat the rest. And all you see is little uh, wings falling down from the sky, little dragonfly wings, unfortunately for the dragonfly. But uh, a very beautiful, majestic bird to watch. Um, we do have a relative of this bird, uh, the Mississippi kite. Uh, we have seen some breeding in the last few years in the southern New Hampshire area. So uh, sounds like some of these birds might be expanding their territories. Another bird far away from its home in southern Texas uh, is this crested caracara. Uh, he was spotted uh, in Amesbury, uh, August 15th, 16th, and was in the area for only a couple of days. As I mentioned, uh, they're normally found in southern Texas uh, and in Florida in some spots. Uh, there's a pocket in Florida where, where they're where they're regularly found, but they also go all the way into Central and South America. Uh, and it's down there, they actually call it the Mexican Eagle, uh, but it's actually a falcon. So it's quite interesting. We have um, a bird who's sometimes called an eagle. That's actually a falcon and behaves like a vulture. So uh, this bird acts a lot like, like our vultures, uh, looking for carrion. And uh, uh, when I saw him uh, on this day, he did find something in the ground. And uh, there were about a half dozen turkey vultures in the same area. And, and at one point, they were all on the ground around uh, this, um, uh, this food source. But the Karakara definitely was the king bird there. And the, uh, he, he, the vultures would not approach until after he flew off. I know, I think it was earlier in 2020 or late 2019, uh, a crested caracara was found in um, mid-state Vermont uh, for a couple of days. Uh, there was so either they're again they're being brought up by some storms or we just have some lost travelers. Uh, another sparrow that uh, we don't see very often is the lark sparrow, uh, unique for its harlequin facial pattern and the white spots on the tail, which you can barely make out here in the photo. Uh, kind of makes it one of those standout sparrow species. And they're mostly occurring in the West and the Great Plains, in the prairies and the grasslands and the pastures out there with the scattered shrubs. So they're actually quite abundant uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and we always have a couple of wanderers uh, come out here. And uh, I know <clears throat> this particular spot at Parker River are called the wardens. Um, they almost seem to always catch a couple uh, every year during migration, both in the spring and in the fall. And this photo was taken at the end of August. <clears throat> and then September brings uh, the migration of a lot of the <clears throat> shorebirds and ducks and uh, uh, sandpipers to our area. And I was fortunate to see this Hudsonian godwit uh, in early September. They're typically a breed that, uh, sorry, they're typically a bird that breeds near Arctic bogs and tidal mudflaps. And they take uh, quite an incredible migration. Uh, they will fly 
from the Arctic nearly 10,000 miles to the tip of South America to spend their, to spend our winters in the summer down there. So this, this is one of those birds that flies a very long way <clears throat> during migration from the, all the way from the North Pole to almost to the South. Another unusual visitor uh, to our area is the buff-breasted sandpiper. And this was one of three that I observed at Sandy Point State Park, which is the southern end of Plum Island. Uh, another high Arctic breeder that we will see during migration, uh, both during the, the spring and the fall. Um, they can be found um, on Plum Island and uh, they are a unique bird in that uh, they're a sandpiper, but unlike most of the other sandpipers, they forage in dry grassy habitats, not wetlands like most of the other sandpipers do. And uh, I caught him out here on the beach away from the water, uh, jumping through the grasses and the shrubs. Uh, and he caught himself a little green caterpillar here or a worm of some sort, picked it right off the, uh, the green vegetation. Uh, just showing you exactly what they, showing me exactly what they do. They're not out there in the mud flats, you know, trying to pick anything, sand fleas or things like that off the, um, off the mud flaps. They're actually in the dry areas uh, looking for insects uh, to eat. And again, sadly, um, Extensive loss of grasslands along the migration route uh, has contributed to heavy population declines. So that's what makes this um, also just a rare bird to be able to see because of the numbers, unfortunately declining. Um, if, we, if we can get back some, some grass, grasslands, um, uh, hopefully uh, this bird uh, won't continue to uh, become endangered. Another rare sparrow um, that we don't see a lot, although we are in a, in a, in a nice place to go find them, um, is this Nelson sparrow. This is at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's one of the short-tailed sparrows, uh, similar to the salt marsh sparrow. Uh, as a matter of fact, these two birds were considered the same species until 1998. Um, and uh, there's very subtle differences uh, in, their, in their coloration along their flanks and their streaking. Uh, but the Nelsons um, is usually found in central, in the central US and the Northern Great Plains. That's where the numbers are. Um, however, we do have them uh, here along the coast of Massachusetts. And they are an endangered species here uh, due to the rising sea levels. Uh, because they're tied to that very thin ribbon of salt marsh that hugs the East Coast. Uh, if that goes away, unfortunately, these salt marsh sparrows will go away. Uh, got this guy in a very inquisitive look. Uh, he hopped, I was observing him with another uh, birder photographer for about a half an hour and uh, he ended up hopping almost within 15 feet of us. Uh, just curious, but still went about his business, uh, pecking at the, the vegetation uh, for some insects. In uh, late October, um, I was able to uh, photograph this chestnut collared long spur. And this was in Hollis, New Hampshire. Uh, it is an immature bird. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the mature bird will have, a, will have a chestnut patch on the back of its neck, thus giving it the name chestnut collared long spur. But this bird is typically found in the short grass prairies and desert grasslands of the Midwest. So they aren't usually uh, in our area, uh, we're more likely to see uh, the cousin bird, the Lapland longspur, 
uh, when they migrate. Uh, so this was definitely uh, an interesting find uh, for us, uh, very much out of its element uh, on the East Coast. Now, this is certainly a bird I would have never thought I would see without going to Europe or Asia. <laughs> this is the common cuckoo. And uh, for those of you who have, who have heard uh, the old fashioned cuckoo clocks, uh, the sound they make is named after this particular bird, the common cuckoo. Uh, this bird was found uh, in Johnston, Rhode Island uh, in early November and spent uh, a couple weeks there from what I can tell from the observation records. It's usually found in Europe and Asia um, and this bird represents only the third record in the lower 48 states uh, of this species. So, you know, there's speculation, not sure how the bird got here. There was even some speculation it might've been a captive bird that cut out, uh, difficult to tell, uh, but we were graced uh, with this bird showing up. Uh, and, you can, and you can see uh, it's a cousin to our yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos that we have um, in this area. Uh, similar shape uh, and uh, even, even, e, uh, even the beak is uh, very similar to that species. He, he put on quite a show. When I was there, um, everybody was following uh, protocols. Everybody was wearing a mask and pretty much, you know, we're keeping our distance. But that day there was probably easily 50 to 75 people walking around this open farm, uh, which they allowed us to walk on. Uh, and this bird was kind of flying up and down the fields. Uh, didn't seem to mind us too much, flew in, flew in and flew down within 15 feet of, the, of a group of people. So didn't seem to be too bothered by the people, uh, but it was, uh, that was the biggest crowd. And you can understand rightly so, uh, being only the, the, the uh, third record in the uh, in the in the, in the uh, uh, U.S. In uh, early November, uh, there was this loggerhead shrike uh, found in uh, East Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and uh, it's a bird uh, quite similar to our northern shrike, uh, but the loggerhead shrikes. Uh, have a thicker black mask and that, and usually a thicker bill. Uh, and the mask will, will actually go more over the beak area, whereas the Nova Strikes will have a narrow black mask and a thinner bill. Um, the reason that, that this bird is so rare around here is that uh, it's normally found in the Southern United States. Um, it's a common bird down there, but it is in steep decline um, as of this time. Uh, certainly this is the time of year uh, we typically see northern shrikes uh, coming down from the north. And I have seen some reports of a few of those um, in the past uh, few months. Here is a white winged dove. Uh, you can see why it's called that. <laughs> uh, as compared to our uh, uh, morning doves, which are very much popular around here, uh, the white winged dove has this very narrow band of white along the edge of the wing, and it's very visible when it flies. Uh, this bird was found in Concord, New Hampshire uh, in early November. And uh, it was there for a couple weeks. And it's originally a bird um, of desert thickets, but now it's become very common in the Southwest, in the southwest cities, um, uh, you know, it, down in Texas and uh, over in um, uh, New Mexico and those uh, states down there and into uh, actual Mexico proper. 
Uh, that's where these birds originally uh, are found. So I can imagine that this was, again was probably one of those birds that were storm driven uh, up to our area. And uh, quite nice to see this bird around here. Something I wouldn't have seen unless I head down south, which I plan to do that sometime in the future. Now, the uh, obviously, maybe to most birders that you may have heard uh, this year uh, is a big eruption year for all finches. Uh, the finch researchers are calling this a super flight, uh, where every species of boreal finch is erupting or moving south in search of food coming out of the boreal forest of the north. Um, <clears throat> here we have uh, four red crossbills in various uh, colors, which I love seeing the colors, the different colors of these birds. Uh, the, the, the reddish ones, the orange and red ones are the males. Uh, a, a, a fully developed male will be pretty much all red. And the females uh, are a yellowish to yellow to, to, a, to a dull green. Uh, looks like the one on the right is probably a female, uh, even though it, it, it is an immature bird because of the thick streaking uh, on the flanks. Uh, but these guys were seen uh, in Montague Plains uh, over in Montague, Mass, uh, a very frequent and well-known spot for seeing these crossbills um, usually any year, but the numbers this year were just amazing. Um, and they continue. Uh, uh, more than anyone's ever seen in, more, in, in over a decade. <clears throat> Scientists tell us that um, the trees uh, have, have evolved these synchronous mast crop cycles in order to limit the food supply for the squirrels. Uh, but then because of these cycles, uh, when, they, when the seeds are in abundance, uh, that seems to be one of the leading factors um, that cause the uh, eruptions. Here is um, a female red crossbill uh, picking off a, uh, I, believe, I believe this is a black pine or a pitch pine. Um, I'm not great at my trees. I, I, I do try and learn them as I go, but um, <clears throat> this is a, on a beautiful uh, morning up at uh, Salisbury State Park. Uh, this is also a spot where you pretty much every winter can find a few of the crossbills, but again, this year the numbers are staggering. Um, I've been finding them up there in, in, in flocks of 20 to 40 to 50 birds coming through there. Um, here is a Beautiful male red crossbill on the top of a pine. Um, see their beautiful colors. Uh, you can see why they're called crossbills. Uh, and those bills are specially designed so that they can reach into those pine cones, uh, open up the flaps and uh, pull out the seeds. And they are voracious eaters. I mean, when you find that flock of 20 to 30 in a couple of trees around you, you can hear them crunching away. Uh, it's quite a sight to behold and a sight to hear. Another finch that we've been seeing more of during this eruption uh, is the pine grosbeak. And here is a photo uh, of a female pine grosbeak uh, taken at uh, Mount Wachusett Community College at the end of November. Uh, and they're being seen, and they're still being seen in the area, especially around crab apple trees. Uh, that's their favorite go-to food, it would appear. And uh, these guys are unique because uh, as I observed them, and on this day, there was probably a group of 20, 12 to 20 pine gross beaks in the area. Um, they will pull off the crab apple 
but they're really after the seed inside the crab apple. And they're not, they're not actually eating the fruit at this point, but they're trying to pull out the seed that's inside the fruit. So uh, very often you'll see them with a very messy beak as they're eating in various uh, conditions. And here's another one. I, I love the rose red, almost pinkish color on these birds. Uh, uh, this bird is a, a bird I haven't seen since my childhood, but it's one of those birds that uh, invokes uh, strong memories of why I got into birding um, when I was young, um, just seeing these beautiful birds. This guy was another really weird one to see this year, but at the end of November, uh, this rock wren was found in Ogunquit, Maine. Uh, it's a wren, much like a relative, much like our marsh wrens um, and house wrens and Carolina wrens, all in that same family. But this bird is found in the arid mist, uh, the arid western parts of North America. Uh, it's very abundant out there. Uh, but to find one out here, uh, very rare. Uh, and a fun fact about this bird is that uh, it is known, uh, sorry, it, it is not known to drink water. So you'll, they've never seen this bird uh, going to sip water from any place. Uh, so it obviously gets all of its moisture needs from its food. And uh, much to its name, this bird was hopping around the rocks along the shore of the ocean, uh, just looking for insects. Uh, again, a, a bird, as far as I know, this bird was observed for a couple of weeks from November into early December. And uh, uh, hopefully um, it has found a way to survive. Although unfortunately, when we see these rare birds who are out of their element, um, you know, the, the prognosis is not good unless they figure out how to fly back to the warmer climes that it's more used to. Uh, although with our milder winters, and this winter has been certainly, I think, so far milder than most, um, it might give these visitors um, a chance to survive. And who knows? <clears throat> uh, this Bullock's Oriole was found in Haverhill, Mass. Haverhill, Haverhill, um, in uh, the first week of December. And uh, this bird is usually found in the open woodlands of the Western United States. So another species that's, we do see here on occasion, they have been wandering out this way, but this was my <clears throat> first uh, observance of a Bullock's Oriole. Uh, it's a young male. Uh, it, 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 will, it will develop um, a lot more black on the top of its head and you see its black chin coming in as well. Um, <clears throat> a very striking bird, um, even as males, uh, as the males go, you know, uh, it's really uh, uh, that black and orange, typical of Orioles, but this, these guys have, have a, a different pattern, almost close to the hooded Orioles. Um, I, like, I like this looking back picture, looking back over the wings and seeing the, uh, the wing bars on this guy and really showing us his, his black beard, his black chin. <clears throat> uh, and then comes the bird that for me was probably the bird that really sucked me into bird watching. I remember um, as, a, uh, as a young adult, a preteen, teenage kid seeing uh, a tree full of these evening gross beaks. Must have been 80 birds in a tree squawking away uh, when I was out playing and uh, was stricken by the beautiful gold and white and black. Uh, here we have um, a picture of a male and a female um, on a gravel road in 
people might wonder why you would see these birds on the gravel road, but birds like almost all the finches um, that do not hull their seed, uh, they need to eat gravel uh, and grit uh, uh, and to get that into their, into their stomach with their gizzard. And that uh, helps them scratch away the, the surface of the seeds to break, in, in order for them to break them down for food. Uh, in this uh, situation, uh, I want to thank um, uh, our other members, uh, Ernie LeBlanc and Jeff Johnston, for uh, letting me know about these birds. Uh, they are in the Royalston Mass area, and uh, they're still being seen, um, uh, which is quite nice. They're being seen in, in, in very good numbers, uh, 20 to 40 uh, uh, birds per flock. Uh, if you get a chance to get out there and see them, um, I obviously strongly encourage it. Here's a picture of, um, of a male pulling off a, a, a crab apple, I believe. Um, and uh, this guy will just eat the whole thing. Here is a photo I took of a yellow-throated warbler. Uh, and this is from Lancaster, Mass. The bird uh, showed up uh, in mid-December and is still there today, um, uh, visiting a couple feeders in this neighborhood in Lancaster. Uh, and this is actually one of the few warblers that we can find during the winter. Um, however, that is usually in the southeastern U.S. So for them to be this far north in winter is definitely rare. Uh, but this is a beautiful specimen. Um, <clears throat> visiting the, he was visiting uh, the, the, the bird feeders. And uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, we were quite a, a distance away from the feeders to, so as to not disturb the bird. And this guy ended up coming along the ground and hopped right within 10 feet of me in a, a three or four other uh, birders uh, looking for insects on the ground. So um, I got very lucky. Uh, this is one of those situations where patience pays off. And uh, believe me, you have to have a lot of patience uh, when it comes to trying to photograph these birds. That's one of the biggest uh, qualities I can uh, would ever want to tell somebody who wants to do uh, similar hobbies. Uh, another angle view of uh, the yellow-throated warbler. Um, love that yellow beard. <laughs> uh, this is definitely a bird that, that I would nickname yellow beard uh, if I had to, if I was naming the bird. And here we get back to more crossbills, uh, but these are white wing crossbills. Uh, they are the more rare uh, bird of the two crossbill types that we see around here. Uh, these birds tend to uh, stay higher up in the boreal forest, but as with, with an eruption, they too have come down uh, to find more food the abundance of food in this area. And they are very much usually hanging out in the same flocks as the red crossbills. So sometimes they'll be mixed in. Um, on this day, um, which happened to be New Year's Day, uh, uh, there was um, an entire flock of white wings. Uh, there had to have been about 18 of them that I counted, uh, a mixture of males and here is the female, uh, similar colors to the female red cross bill, but again, that white wing pattern uh, tells you differently. Another photo of uh, the red, the, the white wing cross bill. Uh, <clears throat> these guys were very photogenic. I, I spent a, a few hours just observing uh, these birds just flying from tree to tree, 
pull, prying out those uh, pine cone seeds and breaking the nut out of that seed and very noisy, very fun to watch. Um, another winter finch that we see here sometimes, but again this year in much higher numbers is the common red pole. Uh, this photo is from Salisbury, Mass on, on uh, New Year's Day, this uh, uh, 12 days ago, I guess. And uh, cute birds, uh, they're often seen flying around the birch trees and eating the, uh, the birch catkins. You see one of those catkins there under the bird to the left. Uh, and a fun fact that I learned about the red poles is that during the winter time, uh, these guys will actually tunnel into the snow to stay warm at night. And uh, they, they could be, they've been found uh, almost four inches under the snow in a foot long tunnels. And that, uh, that's the way that, that, that they keep warm. So fun fact, <laughs> always learning something about these birds. Uh, another uh, interesting species that we don't get around here very often is the Barrows goldeneye. Uh, we are most likely to see the common goldeneye uh, on our coast and uh, on our lakes inland, uh, places like uh, the Kanka River and uh, the uh, Turner's Falls Power Canal. We'll have a lot, uh, have a lot of ducks this time of year. Um, and occasionally uh, we'll get a Barrows goldeneye. Uh, uh, bird that's a little bit different from the common golden eye. Uh, it's got the crescent shaped white uh, facial pattern versus the round oval one. Uh, it has the white patches on its shoulder where well, the common golden eye would not have those white patches. And what I really love about this bird is it gives off that purple hue uh, when it's in the sun uh, versus the common, which will give you a green view. Um, when it's in the sun, <clears throat> but a beautiful, both beautiful birds nonetheless. And the uh, final bird I have, uh, I happened to see just a couple days ago. Uh, this is a Townsend's warbler. And uh, he's currently in Derry, New Hampshire. And this is a warbler that's usually found in Western North America. So anywhere, uh, in the Great Plains and West um, uh, from Canada all the way down to Mexico, uh, we'll find uh, these Townsend's warblers uh, named after a, um, a famous explorer, Townsend, uh, who came down the Colorado uh, doing, uh, uh, looking for wildlife uh, in the uh, early times of his country. Uh, but again, a warbler that we would not typically find um, especially during winter, never mind during the summertime. Uh, <clears throat> however, I know that there's been one also spotted um, on the Cape Cod Canal just, just, just a few days ago. So there are a few around and as you know, it, just, it only takes a couple who, who might be able to, uh, to push out and establish themselves elsewhere. So we'll see about that. And uh, that is my presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to, to uh, try and answer them. All right, well, thanks, Jeff. That was great. Um, really is, uh, this is really fun stuff. I, you know, you saw a whole lot of birds that I've never seen, like the, well, I've saw the common cuckoo in Europe when I was in the army, but you know, I haven't seen one in the US, that's for sure. And uh, a lot of good. So if people have some questions, you could, Put them in the chat, and we'll um, we'll go ahead and try to re relay them to to um, to Jeff. Um, uh, one question for you, Jeff: What's the background of your picture back there? Ah, uh, yes. Um, this is the uh, swamp at Eagle Reserve, or the bog at e Eagle Reserve. Um, certainly, uh, uh, one of my favorite places to visit when I'm in the area, in the Athol area, uh, when I visit my dad. Uh, I uh, love going up to Eagle Reserve. Uh, uh, one of the recent places that uh, 
the Mount Grace Land, uh, Land Trust has been able to, to preserve and uh, a wonderful place to see um, a lot of birds. Of course, the eagles are up there as well. Uh, visitors have come through there like the Sand Hill Cranes last year. Uh, it was just so worthwhile to save these environments. Uh, and of course, I see behind you, Dave, <laughs> is the uh, is the same spot just from the other side, That's uh, right. uh, the uh, observation uh, uh, deck um, at the uh, same Eagle Reserve. Okay, we got a question that's asking about um, the lost visitors that are here, kind of abnormally. Uh, you know, how long do they stay around, or and and when will they fly back? You know, and, and it, there's the weather a factor. Uh, Yes, I'm sure it is. I think um, uh, from what I've read about, um, there, are, there are a number of factors in how they got here in the first place. Uh, uh, the weather may have blown them off course if they got caught uh, ahead of a storm and, and, just, and then they just flew on the, on the headwinds of a storm. That will take them out of their normal area. Um, but then again, also, sometimes some birds just had their internal compass screwed up, I guess you could say, and they just end up flying someplace that they don't normally fly. Um, and is it just mother nature, you know, rolling the dice and trying to get birds to spread out into other areas? Uh, maybe, maybe a food shortage has pushed the bird, try and find food and it keeps on going and going. Um, of course, no one knows the answer 100%, but th these are all theories that I've read about. Uh, and as I was saying earlier, um, once they get here, they really are victims of, of what will happen weather-wise. Um, if they get here in the summer, will they survive um, uh, the winter, the harsh winter here? If they're not used to it, um, the odds are against them. Uh, but if they can find a warm spot to, to roost at night, and they find a, a backyard feeder possibly, they could, they could possibly stay there all winter long and, uh, and, and survive and move on. Yeah, I got two questions on the cuckoo. Uh, first, did you notice what the cuckoo was eating? Uh, the cuckoo was eating insects. Um, uh, it, would, uh, it would fly down to the ground and uh, scratch around the ground and uh, peck, for, peck for the food in the ground and then it would fly up to a perch. Uh, I think uh, I saw them eating uh, moths. Mm. And I think um, that's pretty typical as our cuckoos around here, uh, we see our cuckoos going after caterpillars and moths as their main food supply. So it seems to be a similar you know, insect moth, uh, things that these that that cuckoo was going for yeah and then um so the disposition of this cuckoo um do you think it was flying back to europe or die trying or or um you know i was wondering if i might have heard that it, it might have been seen somewhere else too further south but i'm not sure i can't remember no uh, hopefully it was seen further south which meant it meant it was at least trying to go for some warmer weather to survive the winter um yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't. Who, <laughs> I guess I don't really know. Who's to say uh, whether whether that bird will have the migration um, uh, urge to head back to Europe or if it won't? Because typically they don't cross the ocean. Right. <laughs> typically they they stay in their Europe Asia area. Yeah, oftentimes a lot of these these unusual birds, they don't tend to last long. I mean, number one, they're out of their element, so they're not. They're kind of like a, the odd duck, so they're more prone to predation and other things. And also, they don't have their normal food supply or whatever. So, so their their longevity is often uh, suspect. And again, well, this is how oftentimes birds colonize new areas: is that they they come up and they, you know, they wind up staying someplace, and then, oddly enough, a, one of the opposite sex shows up and we have we started a new population. That's how all the islands in the Pacific have all these different birds on them and stuff. So, you know, it's these are the these are the the front guard sometimes of uh, of changing uh, population dynamics. 
All right, anybody else have any questions? Um, I think we're there. Um, again, I want to thank, uh, you know, Jeff for, uh, you know, the great photography and sharing it with us. And um, uh, I really would like to um, just remind everybody that we'll continue to have more programs. And if you have ideas for programs in the future, uh, please feel free to let me know. And, um, you know, if you happen to see a good speaker somewhere and whatever, and, and we're really looking forward to uh, the chance to get together again in person and and out in the field to see some of these wonderful things. And so thank you to everybody. And we're going to call it an evening. All righty. Good night. Thank you very much, Dave. All right. Good night, Jeff. All right. We're good. Oh, some looks like someone asked me for